Um, now you can see that safe loop takes an exception uh, continuation, this exception handler continuation. And then this comp binding here basically says that at this point in the code where it's bound, if you throw to me, the value that uh, this expression takes on is zero. Otherwise, if you don't throw to me, the expression is here. So either a safe loop returns normally and I takes on this return value, or it takes on whatever is the expression here, given this binding of the message, for example, which the message we ignore. Okay? Um, all right, so here's the full uh, grammar, or at least a cut down version of what the grammar looks like. In the Baumeyer, it's pretty simple. Um, <clears throat> you'll see that we have a comp binder and then a, and a throw, which kind of corresponds to column throw. So we have a comp binding, uh, which is similar to a function, but there's no return necessarily, or not an explicit return, but it can result in a value. Um, and then we have throw, uh, which is how you apply or throw to a continuation. And then we have a special create thread, which is needed to help us to implement more efficient versions of continuations for threading later on, because we don't want necessarily, well, I'll get to it. Okay, so here's an example of how we can implement thread creation using these pri those three primitives. Excuse me. Um, so here we can implement fork, which I think was supposed to have function signature somewhere, but that's okay. Fork takes a function that accepts unit and returns unit, and then fork itself returns unit. Um, so in this example here, okay, good. Um, so we basically just take f and we wrap it inside of another function, and that function will apply f to unit, and then uh, there should be an, a, a unit applied here, but then after applying f to unit, we uh, ask the scheduler to dq the next continuation to throw to. So in fact, wrap f does not return, so this in effect is a delimited um, uh, or like it, you don't want to go underneath your stack frame or, or, or return to nowhere because create thread here is just going to start running it on top of a brand new delimited uh, continuation. So uh, this here is uh, should have a unit here. And then so yeah, we cre call create thread which returns a continuation that takes a unit, and then we just schedule that child thread. Um, or, uh, on, on the scheduler. <clears throat> so this was um, the uh, parent continues on during the fork and just enqueues the child. Here we could just run the child and enqueue the parent. Uh, the way we do this is the first thing we do when calling fork is to capture the continuation at that point, which basically here at this binding we say that we, if we are given unit, fork will return unit. And then after that, we you know create our wrapper of f, and then instead we create a thread for the wrapper of f, and then we enqueue the parent, and then after enqueuing, we do return, and then we can throw it to a child that we just created. So this is this is how you can do it. two two ways of forking. So for our context switch, uh, in this example, in this running example, we're, we're working with like cooperative uh, scheduling. Um, so. Uh, here, well, actually, you could have just interrupts. But, um, so here we could uh, yield by just capturing the continuation, which all it's going to do is just return unit. And then we just enqueue k, and then we just eq another one. So here is where, um, uh, at this point, uh, after enqueuing k, we're kind of doing a little bit of runtime system stuff. Uh, whereas before that, it was just kind of a normal bomb code. But now we're manipulating the scheduler. We have a direct way of uh, expressing the, the scheduler, so the scheduler calls can also be in line, for example. So the scheduler doesn't have to be in C either, basically. Um, so we can do a lot of things uh, with this uh, comp binding mechanism. We can implement locks, we can do message passing, work stealing, which we've done before already in Manticore, and we also have futures, we can do all these things. <coughs> Okay, so uh, given that we have an IR with these continuations, um, we need to decide how they are going to work and how they're going to be implemented. Um, so I mentioned, or I almost tried to mention, uh, first class continuations, these are totally unrestricted um, in their usage. They can be thrown to multiple times and they're totally undelimited. 
Uh, one shot continuations can only be thrown to once, uh, but are also not delimited. And then we have escape continuations where they're delimited by the scope of their binder. So there are uh, uh, so they have a lifetime restriction and they're essentially equivalent to set jump long jump and they can only be thrown to once. Um, yes. Uh, so yeah, um, first class continuations, uh, which is are given by like call CC for example, like Scheme or an SML and J. Um, if you have that, you can do create thread uh, without. You can implement create thread without uh, it being a primitive. That's a typo. Um, so the way you can do it is basically you wrap f inside of a continuation where if you throw to it, you apply f, and then you'll just simply not return and then you just return that continuation. So this is like escaping the function. This would not be okay with escape continuations because uh, thread k escapes its lexical scope. Um, so uh, reasons why this is bad are to include uh, the need to copy the stack, for example, because the, you technically have captured the entire continuation of wherever at whichever point you call to create thread, you return all the way back to the operating system, or I guess the, the, the prompts top level of your interpreter if you, if you do so. So the, the point is that we implement escape continuations in our IR for this work because they're much more efficient. Okay, yeah, so I already mentioned this. Uh, first class continuations with a traditional stack is actually difficult and inefficient. Um, yeah, so uh, other compilers used to map the continuations uh, to stacks whenever possible and um, stack copying would be needed to implement uh, first class continuations or uh, to some extent um, call 1cc which is a, a, a first one shot capture. Um, it depends on if it's mixed with call cc. Uh, so segmented stacks were introduced uh, for Shea scheme to implement call cc more efficiently especially if it basically delays the decision to do the copying until you actually return or, or um, and I think if the I think the call CC actually uh, is escaping. Um, so in SML and J, they use heap allocated continuations that are immutable, so you don't need to do the stack copying to save it in case you want to return twice. Um, and so they just don't even bother having a, like a, a traditional call stack. Okay, so uh, this this gives rise to kind of a spectrum of how you can implement your call stacks. Uh, so at the top, we have individual call uh, stack frames allocated directly in a heap, and these are mutable, so you can reuse them, or you can have them be immutable, so uh, you could basically have one of those, I think, cactus stack or something, where you have multiple stacks that share a trunk, um, or you can have segmented stacks, which uh, I believe, um, well, yeah, this is what Chase team used, but also multi-core family uses a form of this, but they do a full uh, resizing instead of linking individual segments, which is what I'm talking about here, where we have a fixed end by set segment where it may grow. The idea is you, you allocate frames contiguously within this segment. And then this is the traditional C stack where you don't have any stack limit check and it's all contiguous, so if you want a lot of threads, you know, you allocate a whole lot of space. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah. Okay, so um, the heap allocated continuations, which was that link frame one, but immutable, uh, is actually pretty easy uh, to implement uh, because they're just closures. Um, but uh, previous comparisons, uh, checking, like uh, uh, trying to find a difference between abandoning the stack or keeping it, uh, are rather. Uh, Dated and also, especially the Appel Shao one is a little bit controversial because it was only using a simulation. And no one has really addressed this issue in quite some time. Um, so that's what the purpose of this work is, is to compare right now four, but potentially more in the future, uh, uh, four runtime representations, four continuations, all in one compiler system and runtime system. Um, and so we're able to do this uh, effectively because we can take advantage of the fact that LVM supports contiguous stacks very effectively because it's kind of the, uh, one of the most popular C compilers out there. So it has very good algorithms for 
and stack sharing, stack frame uh, allocation. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so our previous model was using uh, heap allocated configurations. Uh, so in order to make the uh, evaluation fair for using uh, stacks, we follow Kelsey and Dan and Wall on analyzing the continuation uses in our CPS IR to actually do essentially a direct style conversion back from CPS to uh, uh, a direct style uh, calling so that um, LVM can generate the uh, stacks for us. And we do this during our closure conversion task because during closure conversion, we're already doing environment analysis as it is. And this is essentially what all those older compilers like Rav and Scheme were doing to um, generate call stacks uh, so that we can actually use the memory uh, for those closures. Um, okay, so let's just take a look at how we translate. I'm calling call, calling it call EC, which is an escape continuation, just like call CC. Uh, this is what it would look like in BOM, uh, where we have this continuation and Whatever, at whichever point call AC appeared, we capture it, and the dot 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 is like whatever body, and then we would apply to the inner function passing the continuation. Uh, how, what does it look like if this is implemented in a lower level language? We don't actually produce the C code, but we are just as efficient as the C code, and this is essentially how it is in the end implemented, where if you're familiar with set jump, long jump, Set jump is a function that can return twice. And so the first time you encounter it, you return, it returns zero. And when it does, then we have basically initialized the continuation and then we pass it to the inner function. So if inner function returns normally, this function returns normally because we return right after. Otherwise, if a long jump occurs, then that's a continuation throw. So control resumes up here, but this time the flag is non-zero. So we will then continue on with this code. So essentially, if your uh, inner function can, uh, is determined to be able to both return normally or throw uh, the continuation is passed, then when you come back, you land at this, I'm calling it basically a landing pad, where you switch on which piece of code based on which throw happened. So if uh, inner function uh, doesn't have its return continuation as a free variable, or as, and that means it doesn't return, then we just get rid of the state state. So it's, it's quite efficient. And that jump buffer is allocated, um, I believe we allocate a little stub on the heap when we do that, but we don't copy the stack. So. All right, and then in our runtime system, we added support for stacks in a few different ways. We have generational stack scanning, which was found to be quite effective uh, at reducing the um, latency of garbage collection. Uh, we also have a non-moving large object area that's needed for those huge contiguous stacks, but also for segmented stacks which we don't move. <coughs> and then we actually implement the optimized segment management described by Brugman. Uh, this was one of the Shea scheme papers that focused on one-shot continuations. And the idea there is that when you overflow to a new segment, you don't want to leave this segment completely full because if you just come back and the function immediately returns, you get a good amount between these two segments. So this was a problem cited by the Go developers and the Rust developers as one of the reasons why they wanted to abandon using segmented stacks. But in this paper, uh, it describes the idea of avoiding this bouncing by moving some frames over so that when you underflow, so we'll always uh, have some more headroom and also um, if you move at least one frame, you won't hit the same frame again because we'll keep moving on that. Daily discussion in the paper. So we move at, at least four frames, or I can't remember, maybe 256 bytes or something of frames over. Um, and we do this very quickly because we don't need to walk the stack. Um, and then uh, this extra space at the bottom of our segments can be avoided if you turn on the flag to you switch to a C stack for every C call. This is something multi-core camel is doing right now. Um, so this area would be gone and then we could have somewhat more compact. Otherwise, if you don't switch to a C stack, uh, we have to put a guard cage at the end of each segment in case you make a C call. Uh, so again, yeah, then this FFI call area starts restraining you a bit. Um, so that's another reason why Rust moved away was that they wanted to have 
as large a large of an enterprise call area as possible. Uh, but we can also test to see whether the cost of switching to a C stack is bad or good. It's probably not that bad. Uh, I haven't evaluated that yet. <coughs> Okay, some general high-level pros and cons before I get to the like, actual evaluation. Um, so in, in contiguous stacks, there's, the benefit is that you have no, virtually no function call overhead because you're not checking stack limit. You have good locality uh, because you're reusing some small piece of memory. And the hardware is really optimized for it because you have return out of stack, etc. And it's easy to translate to LVM. The downside is, of course, you have to allocate very large chunks if you want to support uh, deep enough recursion, especially for uh, functional languages, but if you do overflow, it's also virtually irrecoverable. You have to do some very, very fancy, complicated tricks to recover from a page fault in this way, because that essentially means that every point in your code must be a safe point for the garbage collector. So some techniques uh, exist, uh, I believe for Java, there's one where they do like an interpretation of the remaining instructions until the next safe point. <laughs> to mutate the state until you get to there, and then you know the state of where all live values are. Uh, if you're using a non, if you're using a conservative GC, I guess it doesn't matter, but. That actually goes way, way back to a system But there is a paper on it, I haven't seen Alright, so uh, segmented stacks, I bolded, so is it, I bolded the differences between the previous pros and cons and the current ones, because there's a lot of overlap. Um, so you have better space overhead because you can allocate you know, smaller chunks and then you can always grow it. And then this allows you virtually arbitrary recursion depth up until your operating system says no, um, or you, until you can't very quickly. And then it has all the other benefits. I kind of like in between is the thread creation space and overhead is kind of moderate. It's not the best, but of course uh, it's a tunable parameter because you could change how large your segments are to try and reduce your internal fragmentation. Um, but the trade-off is um, if you make your segments uh, too big to speed up your sequential performance, then uh, you will pay the price in space. Um, okay, and then because we have segments, we have to also check for stack overflow uh, so that we can hand, uh, handle it and then uh, overflow to a new segment, so there's a little bit of overhead there. Um, okay, so heap allocated stack frames, these are the mutable linked frames that I showed you earlier. Um, so they have minimal space overhead and it's really che uh, uh, cheap in terms of memory space to create threads. Um, there is some additional calling overhead because you essentially have to dedicate another register as the frame link pointer, so you basically don't get frame pointer elimination. Um, and in, in fact, uh, and, oh, and, uh, and also because you're allocating all these frames individually in the heap, obviously it's going to have a high uh, heap allocation rate, but not super high because you're able to reuse these when you return from calls. So. Um, and also, it adds a lot of complexity in implementing a garbage collector from my experience. And I don't know of any systems that actually do this, but we wanted to add this. Out. Yes? My system does that. Oh, really? <laughs> Is it difficult? We're doing hardware garbage collection and we're using heap allocated stack frames because we can get significant performance and nice, uh, nice trustworthiness from the out of it. So oh. we should talk. Okay, cool. Okay, and then. And then we have heap allocated continuation closures. These are the mutable uh, stack frames. So again, minimal space overhead, minimal thread creation overhead, uh, all the other good benefits. Uh, we have a higher heap allocation rate, and I should also mention much, much simpler implementation because it's essentially just function closures. You don't need any extra work. Um, uh, one downside is it's not so easily uh, modeled in LVM, but this is a work in progress for connection GC. And then 
uh, it also has a larger code size because you have to copy frames on, if you have sequential non-tail calls within a function, you have to copy the frames, live values over, depending on the live range of those values. Uh, although, there are Oh yes, yes. Uh, safer space share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, 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 that's yes. That's a yeah, yeah. I forgot to mention that our closure representation is traditional or simple flat closures. Uh, if you look at Xiao and Appel or Appel and Xiao, uh, their paper on space efficient closure representations, I think it's SFS or whatever the, the there, you get a uh, much more efficient um, uh, representation, but that doesn't actually even fit inside the linked frames anymore. It kind of is like uh, mini frames that are shared amongst multiple frames. It's actually quite an interesting way you would look in memory. Christ. <laughs> Just take your badge off. Oh, yeah. quite a lot, so they're actually important to include here. But we also wanted to include ones where recursion is not the main bottleneck in terms of performance, because of course uh, uh, Ackerman's function, for example, is a trivial amount of work, but a lot of recursion. Um, but Mace phone, for example, is a lot of kind of traditional uh, uh, functional programming. Okay, so this here shows, um, this graph shows our speed up on our sequential benchmark suite relative to using a contiguous stack. So on the bottom here are all the benchmarks. We've sorted them from left to right where the left ones are the smaller ones and the right one is the largest amount of lines of code. And those are real lines of code. And then, um, so here taller is better, but in fact most of the benchmarks except for a few such as SCC which is uh, a code to find strongly connected components in a graph. Uh, interestingly, is a bit faster than, all of them are a bit faster than the contiguous stack. But you'll see that there are some huge, um, I have these written down. Yeah, so we have a pretty large uh, performance cliff or, or, or difference in uh, these recursion heavy benchmarks, such as TAC, which is the Takuchi function, and then ACK, which is Ackerman function. And since TAC and act, TAC and FIB are virtually the same, that's why their curves also look, or their bars look almost the same. Um, quite an interesting. <coughs> okay, so I'll, um, another graph uh, that's interesting is to look at its function flow. Um, so you can see here that adding the, um, this is again relative to contiguous stack, and in this time, truer is better. So you can see here that um, the, Segmented stacks, and this is function bloat as in only the user code, not um, garbage collector or whatever is included. So these will be uh, more dramatic changes. Uh, so this isn't the total binary size. But in general, you're going to expect 3% more uh, code if you segmented stacks for all those uh, stack limit checks. And you'll notice that heat frame is quite a bit higher. Uh, the good, there's a good reason for this one. It's because the heat frame implementation does not currently have uh, leak call optimization where we can avoid allocating a uh, frame there. I still have to implement that in all of them. Um, what else? Okay, and then so heat closure, you can see is roughly like 30 to 45% higher. 
this is expected because we're using flat closures, so we have to copy the whole. So if there's a very large like, line range, we have to copy that value to every frame every time. So uh, there is a cost in terms of at least function size uh, to using uh, immutable stack frames. Okay, so let's dive into the Ackerman benchmark because that's such a large performance difference. So here uh, I ran our entire benchmark suite on Cache with Cache Grind as well. And here we have a breakdown of uh, which instructions uh, contributed to total execution. Um, so this scale down here is in billions of instructions executed. And then what this stack chart shows that if it's here in the blue or on the left, it's the user code instructions. And then there's GC and runtime system. So you can see that both heap closure and heap frame are significantly slower than uh, segmented stacks or regular stacks because a lot of its time is spent in the garbage collector. And this is primarily due to the recursion uh, pattern in Ackerman function because we don't see this occurring in TAC or um, uh, FIB, for example, because the recursion pattern is more like a tree. Um, but I believe Ackerman's recursion pattern runs up and down a stack quite a lot. So you tend to promote a lot of data out of your nursery that was heap allocated and then you may refer to it a bit, but then it all becomes garbage. So you spend a lot of time promoting data. So I have, I didn't collect garbage collector stats in this run because I didn't have enough time, but I previously analyzed the Ackerman benchmark and we saw a large amount of data being promoted out of our first generation. So one potential way to fix this, which is kind of the common way to increase your nursery size, for both of these. Right now our nursery I believe is one megabyte, which should be reasonable, but I believe, I, I expect that if you were to increase it, you'd see this go down quite a bit. But yes, most of our time is spent in the garbage collector. Yes? Um, I'm also curious as to why the user code time has increased on heat closure and heat break. Do you, do you know why that is? Um, well, if they're entering the garbage collector much more often, there's a little bit of user code required to, to basically save the state to enter the garbage collector um, for heat frame. And then heat closures are going to be higher just in general because it has to do more, um, it has to allocate more frames in there. Well, and the column dimension is just more code. Oh, yeah. And the heat frame. Yeah, the heat frame also has to update the um, uh, frame pointer. We have frame pointer elimination in stack, for example. There's no frame pointer in segment of the stack here. So there's you know, a few instructions here and there, it's going to add up. I guess this is a rather deep, heavy uh, recursion. We've executed that many times. Um, OK, so L1 uh, data cache read misses. So I'm looking at read misses because writes in general, I expect the write buffer to handle them. But for read misses, if we dig into this, we can see that um, not only are we spending more time in the garbage collector, but a good amount of our time, this time it's only half the amount of reads uh, missed, and this is in millions of cache misses, um, are actually incurred by the garbage collector here. Um, so, uh, and I believe that the setup for cache ground here was our L1 cache was 32 kilobytes. So you can expect that we have some cache misses on one megabyte nursery. And the, almost the entire nursery is live, which actually the case, I believe, it was a huge percentage of the nursery is live. So it counters many of the arguments that um, Appel and I think um, Clavez and a few other people had made in the previous work, which was that like, in general, I mean, 2 percent of your nursery is live. So uh, in this case, actually, a large amount of the nursery is live. But of course, not for stack and set, segment and stack and regular stack that we use. Right. We, re we recover the memory one <clears throat> So this probably should have been a log scale graph. But they didn't have time. Uh, so these are user code read misses. This is relative to contiguous stacks. Uh, obviously, with you know TAC, L, FID, and regular TAC, they're actually it was actually so large that Google Sheets couldn't handle the bar. It generated a correct PDF for the bar. <laughs> it was like huge. Um, but of course, I just cut it down. Let's just take a look at um, how the read misses look for other benchmarks. Uh, I guess other than these really spiky ones, you may be surprised to see that our read misses are not so bad for heat closure. For example, in the primes benchmark, we're actually beating both contiguous linked frames and segmented stacks. Um, but otherwise, and you know, say for SCC, and we also do better. 
Oh yeah, well that's all this. We do better on the Oh, this is relative to the speed of stack. Yeah. Yeah. Alright. Um, so to put our results in perspective, we also ran all of our benchmarks for built-in. And uh, you can see that I, so I've only chosen the contiguous stacks, and that's what's relative to the speed up. Um, and the dark bar is Milton. It's kind of surprising that we're faster than Milton in many of the benchmarks, because you know, taller is higher. And in a few of them, at least. Uh, we're obviously not doing enough optimization in like these three benchmarks and TACL. TACL is the Takuchi function which uses lists for numbers. Um, the reason why this happens is because I've looked at the assembly code generated by Milton and they just don't implement a very efficient way of doing calls. Like, I believe they're growing their stack up instead of down on x86. Um, and so I don't think they're taking advantage of you know, call and return instructions. Uh, so, and I have another graph showing indirect branch miss rates. Um, so all of the calls being made by Heat closure, for example, in the FID and TAC one have a relatively high um, indirect branch miss rate given the uh, indirect branch predictor in cache drawing, which is relatively simplistic, like 2004 ish technology. Um, I didn't include that because I'd rather use data from Perf for something to give us maybe what the Xeon machine in the Renaissance is actually doing, but uh, I, you know, also I just didn't have time to look at so one, is, is, is in TACL it's lists of units? Yeah, yes. Yeah, so probably also turns that into just a link chain one set, you know, one word per concept. Oh, yeah, I guess that was representation optimization. Yeah, yeah, but we, we do an okay job on some of them. Like this maintenance fund, for example, we're actually not too far from Logan, which is kind of surprising. Um, but I guess there wasn't too much shock noise there. It's just it's a two-dimensional list for a grid, and then we, we, we do operations on that. We're better than. Mm, oh, yeah, we're actually better. Well, it's all it's all it's a lot of heavy recursion, so yes, yeah, we do better. Our, our our contiguous stacks are very very efficient. Okay, so yeah, uh, concurrency costs. Well, this is why it's a work in progress. Um, as I mentioned, it's actually quite difficult to deal with heat allocated frames, especially when uh, the garbage collection system was set up to handle immutable data as efficiently as possible. Throwing in mutable data into the heap adds some complications when you want to promote one call stack into a shared heap so that another thread could potentially synchronize and use it. So it's a bit complicated, but we have a design in mind to fix this issue. Um, and so, yeah, uh, but Early experiments with just contiguous stacks and segmented stacks showed that creating um, threads, like thread creation was a lot cheaper for heap allocated continuations. Um, uh, mostly because you don't have to allocate a new and initialize an underflow frame, for example, to handle um, uh, uh, how many, uh, to handle like an underflow to jump to the scheduler like that wrap F that I mentioned. Uh, although we may try to optimize that. Um, at least I believe that's the reason. Okay, so yeah, the heat allocated frame implementation is needed. In, it needs two optimizations. Leap call optimization I already mentioned is like probably in a week or two maybe. Uh, one other thing is that because we're heat allocating the frames, we don't need to do a heat test in the entry block of the function uh, heap limit test because we already have to do one in the function prolog. So one optimization I'm going to add is to remove those tests and include the amount of allocation it checks for in the prolog. So that's another reason why potentially so we may be doing two tests in the entry block, but if that doesn't happen to be so common in the very tight recursion examples, we have an unboxing pass, so many of those functions do zero allocation. Zero allocation of like part. So yeah. It's not a loose connection now. 
Oh, yeah, it says battery low, but this might work. Oh. <laughs> There's it's just a screw. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, this might work. So, uh, so in conclusion, uh, we need to finish our experiments first before we can draw any strong conclusions. Uh, but from what we've seen, it seems that segmented stacks might be the best choice because there's a lot of benefits to be had with segmented stacks if you're willing to trade a little bit of performance. Um, there may be some issues you may run into with the like foreign function calls. I know multi-core camel is totally okay with switching to a C stack. I can uh, uh, add some tests to see how fast foreign function calls are in, in the full evaluation. I don't know why Go didn't. Uh, so I know. So there's also that you know stack frame copying optimization. I'm not sure whether Rust and Go used it because that should have gotten rid of the hot split problem they cited. Um, uh, yeah. So I don't know if the locality benefits for you using the heap allocated frames are any better than uh, the uh, immutable frames because you do reduce some heap allocation, but when you're a garbage collector for an ML-like language. It's already designed to handle very high allocation. It's like only, it's less high, but it's still pretty high. Um, uh, yeah, so heap allocated continuation closures are pretty low. Uh, they're not super low for a lot of the recursion heavy tests, but it seems like a good choice if you just want to get going as easy as possible. Um, but of course, we still need more experiments and we need to dive into like more. Uh, we need to gather more data <laughs> to, to, to finish this study. Um, so, because we, you know, so, yeah, uh, that's it. Have I tried comparing going upwards as well? No, um, because LLVM definitely does not support that, and I think it makes a lot of assumptions about, like when you say target x86 stack growth down always, um, it would be really hard to change that. Um, I think I also noticed some cases where it was boxing an integer when it really didn't need to. So like maybe some really corner case things can be fixed in Milton, but I do think that it would probably make more sense if they used the call return and had their stack grow downwards. I don't know what, why it grows upwards, but I believe it does. Yes. Did you have a question? I was just curious if the scheme compared against the native, the, the straight and code generator, not the LLVM version. Yeah, no, AMD 64 backend. Not, not LLVM. And I use a 2018 version. Yeah. I want to ask about um, which architecture did you test on? Oh, I tested on x86-64. So that also would have a factor in the code size because yeah. the push pop instructions are smaller in coding than live. Also, I forgot to mention that the code size is actually VM size. It's not on disk. So I use a tool that tells you how large it will be in process memory. 